Let's get you to the weekend, a long weekend. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equities higher, bond yields are two again. We're going to talk about that. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, the AI frenzy driving big equity market gains. A debt deal taking shape going into the weekend as investors price out rate cuts and price in hikes. We begin with the big issue, the race to secure a deal and enjoy the long weekend. Republicans are driving us down a dangerous road of default. Many extreme MAGA Republicans have made the political calculation that a dangerous default and crashing the economy and triggering a recession is in their political interests. The Democrats today are not the same Democrats. They're very extreme. We see them up their anger right now against the president when he's trying to curb spending at the same time negotiating with me. That's not productive. So publicly, lawmakers are still busy insulting each other. Privately, the contours of a deal are coming together. According to people familiar with the matter, the two sides have narrowed some of their differences in recent days. Negotiators said to be moving closer to an agreement to raise the debt limit and cap federal spending for two years. President Biden remaining optimistic. Speaker McCarthy and I have had several productive conversations, and our staffs continue to meet as we speak, as a matter of fact, and they're making progress. I've made clear time and again defaulting on our national debt is not an option. Just for good measure, to focus minds, talks getting another reality check. The Treasury's cash balance dropping below 50 billion, according to the latest data. That's down from more than 76 the day before and almost a third of what it was in the middle of May. Joining us now to discuss, Anne Marie down in DC alongside Kelly Lyons. Morning, Anne Marie. Good morning, John. So we are seeing potentially the contours of a deal before we head into this long Memorial Day weekend. And this is important because when Speaker McCarthy took the gavel, became Speaker, he told his members he would always give them 72 hours to read legislation. So potentially, if they're able to come to an agreement today, get the text worked up, we could see a vote as soon as Tuesday. And that's going to be necessary because we are really starting to close this gap ever so narrow towards June 1st. There's one thing we should mention when we're talking about the contours of this deal. Yes, it raised the debt limit. Yes, it capped spending. But at what level does it cap spending? What our reporting from Kayla Gardner and Justin Singh talk about is that actually defense spending would go up, and they do want to make sure that there is going to be enough funding for veteran programs. One win the GOP, Jonathan, may be able to get is that they're going to take $10 billion out of the $80 billion that was supposed to go to the IRS from the President's Inflation Reduction Act. But progressives, one win they're going to get is a measure when it comes to renewable uh, energy. And this has to do with transmission lines, and the GOP will get speeding up of permits. So something in there for everyone, but Speaker MacArthur, McCarthy made it very clear. Not everyone is going to be happy with this deal. And that is why next week, even if there is an agreement today, is going to be very difficult. And Kelly Lines, that's what we've got to focus on. What, or rather who, are you focused on right now? Well, it's the far wings of both parties, right, John? Because in theory, those on the far right side of the Republican Party don't want Speaker McCarthy to be giving up too much. They would like to see deep spending cuts like in the bill that the House already passed. Then on the Democratic side, the progressives don't want to see stricter work requirements for entitlements. And we understand that that is an issue that has not been fully worked out yet. So if you have members of both parties that may not be satisfied with the ultimate compromise, that is what makes the whip count and the actual passage of whatever deal they come to very difficult. And again, we're working against the clock here because, remember, June 1st, the earliest potential date Jenny Yellen has outlined as the next date, is on Thursday. There is not a lot of wiggle room. And even some of the ideas, the alternatives that have been floated to avoid a uh, default scenario like prioritization or the 14th Amendment or even something like a trillion-dollar coin, Fitch ratings uh, in the last several days when issuing that ratings watch negative for the U.S.'s AAA credit rating said all of those things would not be consistent with the AAA rating and still could result in a downgrade, even if the Treasury continues to make payments on its debt. I'll speak for all of us. None of us want to be tracking this going into the weekend. AMH, <laughs> Kelly Lyons, the yeah. two of you, wonderful work through this week. Looking forward to your coverage into next week as well. Joining us now, Mohammed al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohammed, what a privilege to round out this week with you, and what an interesting week it's been. Can I just start in the Treasury market? Yields aren't falling. Treasuries aren't rallying. Yields are rising. 
Treasury to sell enough. Mohammed, what's going on there? What's going on is that the marketplace is recognizing what you and I have spoken about is that inflation is sticky and that the service sector in particular in the US economy is red hot. So we are pricing in more Fed action and we're also pricing in, ironically, John, that this will end up being a Fed policy mistake. So in addition to the yields moving up, we've got a two stand inversion now that's at 75 basis point. Um, so you're getting the sense that the Fed is going to have no choice but to raise, to hike rates even more. But that will end up risking a recession because the Fed has started so late. And the marketplace has now embraced that possibility. We were just reflecting on the debt ceiling saga at the moment. Mohammed, how different is this one to the one that you lived and breathed at PIMCO 10 years ago with 5% CPI? It's different, John, because of the working assumption. Um, at that time, we did not have the working assumption that this will get resolved. Most of us in the marketplace assume that this will get resolved. It doesn't mean there aren't longer term costs. There are, there are three in particular. One is you erode trust even more in policymakers domestically. Two is you divert politicians away from the work they're supposed to be doing in order to enhance growth, enhance productivity. And third, you signal to the rest of the world that the US economy is less predictable. So, you know, even though we're going to resolve this, and I believe we are going to resolve this, there is longer term damage being created. I want to borrow a phrase of yours, risk mitigation characteristics. Do you think this arose the risk mitigation qualities of treasuries? It does, John, because it comes on top of many other things. Um, you know, countries, third countries, what Jared Cohen of Goldman Sachs called geopolitical swing states, they can go either way, um, are getting worried about reliance on the U.S. debt markets, about reliance on dollars. And unfortunately, the very well-intentioned and necessary sanctions on Russia, I want to stress, they were necessary and they're well-intentioned, has pushed Russia into creating a small ecosystem, as cumbersome as it is, um, that bypasses the dollar. So now countries are thinking, well, maybe it's not as non-feasible as we thought initially. So the last thing we want to be doing in the US is giving people excuses to look for little pipes that go around both the dollar as a reserve currency and our debt markets. Well, you introduced the US dollar, so let's go there. Do you think the dollar crisis is over now that the dollar started rallying again, Mohammed? Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but we have had quite a move from 110.95 on the single currency all the way back down to 107. Correct, because the interest rate differentials have moved in favor of the U.S. of the last month. John, you know this. We've moved 90 basis points higher on a two-year in, in just over three weeks. 90 basis points. It's amazing. I'm looking at the moves right now. We're almost at 460 on a two-year. So this is the 11th day the yields have been climbing consecutively, 11 days straight. I go back to about 390 on May 11th, so that's something like 70, a 60, 70 basis point move just over that period. Mohammed, I was looking at the UK gilt market as well this week. The two-year there, up 54 basis points this week. Now, Mohammed, I think some people reflecting on the UK and the experience of September, October time and the gilt crisis, if we can call it that, do you think there are maybe things starting to come together that remind you of what happened in that period? Well, there's some fundamental differences, as you know, John. Back then, it was a fiscal policy mistake. Today, it's in response to not just headline inflation not falling as fast as people had expected, but core inflation going up. So there's now a recognition that the Bank of England is, is going to have to hike, and the market has priced in a peak rate of 5.5%. So it's, it's not fiscal driving this. It is anticipated monetary policy. That's issue number one. Issue number two is that this is not viewed as a crisis. This is viewed as a chronic adjustment to higher inflation. And therefore, and this is important, therefore, the longer term growth effects are going to be, str are going to be more detrimental. Um, Mortgage rates are already moving up. Nationwide announced this morning 45 basis point increase in the mortgage rates. So this is this is going to make stagflation 
more likely than the U- than than not in the UK, unfortunately. There's the word stagflation, just for the UK, mm-hmm. or for others too in Europe as well. Given the disappointing data we've had out of China. So you know, when you go away from the UK, you don't have an 8.7 percent headline inflation. Um, it's lower in Germany, it's lower in France. Now we know that the German economy is already in recession. Uh, so yeah, you may get stagflation light. Uh, the U.S. is the one that should avoid it unless we get policy mistakes. So the U.S. is is the is the outlier in all this because its domestic economy is much more dynamic, much more resilient, and and also much hotter, if you like, than elsewhere. Mohammed, I just wonder how you'd characterize the inflation growth mix then in the United States, given the data we've had. We've talked about this a few times, both online and offline. You look at manufacturing data worldwide right now, it's screaming downturn, cut rates. You look at services, it's screaming hike. What is the kind of growth inflation mix you're expecting now? So the inflation one is very straightforward, that because the Fed was late, inflation went from a few items to the goods sector, and then got embedded in the service sector. And that has two results. One is it makes inflation less sensitive to interest rate increases. And two, it makes wage inflation more likely. So when you get that migration, and that's why economists hate a central bank falling behind, when you get that migration, you get a dualistic economy. Because interest rates will hit the goods sector, starting with housing, but will not impact the service sector as much. So that's what you get for a while. And then it depends on what central banks do. Um, And that's why, John, the yield curve is inverting more, because the market strongly believes that the Fed is going to hike once, maybe twice more, and then it's going to have to reverse its hikes late in the year, because it's going to, this will prove to be too much for the economy as a whole. Final question then, where are you for June and beyond on the Fed now? So, John, what they should be doing, as you know, is they should be recognizing that the monetary framework is not fit for purpose. They should be recognizing that the inflation target of 2% is the wrong inflation target. And they should be implicitly aiming for a high inflation target until the time comes when they have the credibility to change the inflation target. That's what they should be doing. And if that's the case, they would not hike. But I think this Fed will hike because it is overly data dependent. And the data clearly, short term data clearly says hike, even though your measures, your policy measures have a lag in in terms of effects. And this is also a Fed that's so worried about its credibility that it's not gonna be wanting to fall behind even more in the perception of people. And it doesn't have the confidence to stand up and say, look, we operate with a lag and we don't want another policy mistake. So just to be clear, as things stand, just to wrap it up, I know we've still got CPI still to come before that decision, payrolls as well, but as things stand right now, you think they hike in June? I do, and the market thinks they hike in June. Mohamed, we appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Mohamed al enjoy the long weekend. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Looking for a hike in June. Bank of America just published. They say we still expect the Fed to keep policy rates unchanged at its June meeting, but it's a close call. And it's getting closer, which is why you're hearing people like Mohammed say, we might be getting the move just around a corner. Let's get a move on now, going into the opening bell, 17 minutes away. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, let's take a look at one stock that is soaring this morning, and that is uh, the Gap. Shares are up more than 10%. It could be a short squeeze, though. There's a pretty decent short uh, interest on this stock. Actually, it's coming off of those highs, but they put up a surprise profit of a penny versus a loss of 16 cents, and inventories are down, uh, and gross margins are going in the right direction. On the other hand, Ulta Beauty, the opposite story, their operating margin, they have cut it on theft. Uh, the CEO saying it's a concerning challenge. As for Marvell, well, the AI boom continues. They put up a big uh, outlook for 2024, saying that their AI revenue will double. Abby, thanks for that. Coming up on the program, traders price again another rate hike after a busy stretch of Fed speak. Some of the uh, declines we've seen so far in inflation have been a little slower than I might have anticipated, but we are starting to see some positive movements. The economic data beating expectations, that conversation up next.
some of the uh, declines we've seen so far in inflation have been a little slower than I might have anticipated, but we are starting to see some positive movements. And um, I do think that, again, we can get there without a significant downturn, recognizing that there are a number of risks that we face. And back and forth we go. Investors pricing out rate cuts, pricing in rate hikes. Expecting the Fed to raise rates by another 25 basis points this summer. The change of heart coming with front-end yields moving higher for 11 consecutive sessions. And investors digesting a busy two weeks of Fed speak, revealing some of the divergence amongst officials. City's Andrew Hollenhorst expecting incoming data to keep, quote, the Fed on track to hike 25 basis points in both June and July to bring a terminal rate around to 550 to 575. Mike McKee, the data, pretty impressive stuff. Data, pretty impressive stuff. Let's take a quick look at those Fed odds because you're right, John, after the PCE inflation numbers, investors have totally changed their minds about what's going to happen on June 14th. 58% chance now of an increase on June 14th. And in July, July 26th, a 100% chance. So we're looking at somewhere between uh, 25 and 50 basis points more going on. Here's the reason for it, those inflation numbers. Uh, the Fed had been making progress, but that progress stalled in April as we saw the PCE in, uh, numbers uh, for both core and headline rising more than expected and on a year-over-year -year basis rising 4.4% and 4.7%. That is not, obviously, what the Fed wants to see. Uh, interesting chart there you had with all of the Fed speakers that we've had, and we put the sorting hat on one more time, and we can see where they all are lining up at this point. And and what is hard to tell is whether anybody's going to switch sides at this point. But right now you've got uh, four people, four voters who are on the team worried, uh, four who are on the team pause. So where are they going to go? And the problem we're going to have, John, is we're not going to hear from Williams, Barr, or Cook now before this next Fed meeting, at least according to the schedule. So we don't know if we're going to pick up uh, one on uh, either side of those votes. But it's definitely going to be interesting going into June 14th to see what happens. You call that a problem. Some people might be happy with that, Mike, because they get very sick of the Fed speak. And the good news is for those people that there is no Fed speak today going into the long weekend. Mike, always love catching up with you. Mike's going to stick around. We're going to catch up with Mike in about 30 minutes time or so, looking ahead to payrolls next week as well. Joining us now to discuss is Lafayette College, Krishna Mamani and Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management. Seema, I want to come to you. Andrew Hollenhorst says they're going to hike in June. Mohamed al literally 10 minutes ago, said they're going to hike in June. What say you? Well, so we have had a, a long-term forecast, or, well, I guess a forecast for the last year or so, that the Fed would, uh, would peak at 525 to 550. So in line with that, yes. I think another hike is likely, whether it's going to be June, July, I think is maybe up uh, for question. You know, I know we've seen a lot of very strong data. We've just seen the core PCE numbers, um, but we still, you know, there is a lot to play for. There's still the CPI, there's still the non-farm payrolls next week. And I think things could switch, um, but certainly at this stage and looking at the strength of the economy, looking at the, the strength of the stickiness of inflation that we continue to see, um, I think certainly the market is finally moving in the right direction and taking out rate cuts. And the impressive data. Now, I said impressive twice there, and I'm using that loosely. Impressive relative to expectations, upside surprises. Krishna, has that impressed you? Yeah, the, the economy itself has been quite impressive. You know, uh, uh, Mohammed talked about housing being the most interest rate sensitive sector. And if you look at housing data, there's no sign of any slowdown whatsoever. So I, I, I think the economy, you look at claims, you look at inventories, you look at uh, consumption, you look at income growth, there's really not a significant sign of any slowdown whatsoever. You know, it may come down in the future, but it, it doesn't seem like that today. I just wonder, Krishna, how divorced this market is right now from rates and this economy as well. When you look at the home builders, I had this conversation with Tom on Bloomberg Surveillance earlier this morning. From last June, the home builders on the S&P are up something like 60, 70 percent, Krishna, even with rates at 7 percent for a mortgage in America. What do you make of that? Well, so I, I think what that is telling you is that uh, because of all sorts of reasons, uh, 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 economic restructuring in terms of people moving out in the suburbs or stimulus or uh, come up with anything you want that housing is probably uh, is not as interest rate sensitive as we have we have assumed it to be based on our past experience and I think that is the differential this time around. Seema what's your view on that one? Well 
So very, very similar view here from, from my side. The, the fixed rate situation in the US just means that there's a there's very, very little interest in selling at the moment and getting a new mortgage at a considerably higher rate. And as a result, there's a lack of stock available for people who are looking to buy. And there's always going to be people looking to buy. So then the one that's going to benefit from this is going to be home builders. Uh, so it is maybe a little bit surprising in the context of a um, of significant rate hikes, uh, potential for a slowing economy, but then taking a step back and then just thinking about the fact that you've got the fixed versus variable in the US, maybe it does make sense that the housing market is less interest rate sensitive than maybe previously. Can you say the same thing about the economy? Or would you sit here and say it's all about longer variable lags from here, the cumulative tightening already delivered? So we do believe that there is going to be recession in the US. We think it's going to be a really short, shallow one. Um, clearly, what we have seen from the US is just generally speaking, not just, of course, the housing market, but it is less interest rate sensitive um, than you've seen in previous cycles. You know, you've got lower debt levels. You have um, the excess saving part of the equation, which continues to be really, really important. Uh, but these things are slowly being exhausted. So we do think that there will be a slowdown. But of course, it is certainly taking a while to, to play out. See Michelle, Christian Mamani, sticking with us. We're saving the equity market debate for about seven minutes' time. We've got to talk about this rip-roaring story in big tech and AI specifically. So up next, the morning calls, then later, Wall Street starting to rethink the gloomy outlook. City joining a growing list of strategists that are warming up to equities. That conversation just around the corner. Equity futures higher on the S&P 500. The opening bell about seven minutes away. Five minutes out from the opening bell, equities up going into the weekend by about 0.2 percent. A little bit firmer on the Nasdaq, up by 0.3. That's the price action. Let's get to the morning calls. Morgan Stanley naming American Express a top pick, seeing an attractive entry point with potentially 20 percent upside. Piper initiating coverage on United Health with an overweight rating, expecting the company to deliver sustainable, best-in-class earnings growth over the next decade. That stock is up by 0.3 percent. And finally, Walt Research downgrading Snowflake to pick perform saying the current valuation leaves very little room for error that stock just a bit softer in early trading we're down there by 0.3 percent coming up the rally in big tech fueling fears of missing out the bearish calls getting harder to hold that conversation coming up next your opening bell just around the corner Twenty-five seconds away from the opening bow to wrap up a really interesting week in this equity market. Equity futures just slightly positive. Some positive follow-through after the monster gains in yesterday's session. On the S&P 500 right now, positive by 0.1 percent. On the Nasdaq, up by around about 0.3. There's the opening bow. Switch of the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this: higher by a single basis point, 383 on a 10-year. On a two-year, the data looking good again, relative to expectations. Mike McKee will give you a run-through of that. A little bit later in the program, we'll catch up with him again in 15 minutes or so. But we have got on our hands right here 11 consecutive days of high yields at the front end of the curve. The two year up another four, looking at 460. We're talking about 70 basis points worth of weight added on to the front end of the curve in 11 sessions. And with that, some dollar strength, a challenge to the Euro bulls. The Euro breaking down to about 107, trying to bounce. It's a pretty tame bounce. 107.32, positive by not even 0.1%. And crude struggling to get back to 73, 72.83, positive by about 1.4%. Around the open then, 40 seconds into the session, your broader equity market positive by 0.2% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, up by 0.3. What stock to watch at the open is the gap, reporting better than expected results, with cost-cutting measures improving the retailer's profitability. The interim CEO saying, quote, we continue to to take the necessary actions to drive critical change, ultimately getting us back on a path towards delivering consistent 
long-term results. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, they did put up a surprise profit. They put up a penny versus the estimated loss of 16 cents. And as you mentioned, it had everything to do with cost cutting along with discounts. Now, relative to the cost cutting, they had a reduced headcount. They also trimmed other expenses on the discounts that had to do with uh, freight and uh, other types of uh, discounting their merchandise less. But it's a top-line issue. So this stock going into today down more than 30 percent, an 11 percent short interest. So today's pop up about 10% right now could be a short squeeze. The question is whether or not they can return the Banana Republic and the Athleta to uh, greater growth. Uh, comps at both of those stores declined. Old Navy down just a little bit. The gap up 1%. So they need to get the merchandise right so that they can also get the top line growth that they need for that long term turnaround that they're talking about. But perhaps this profit, uh, some of the bottom line coming into view in the way that analysts would like to see, a good start, John. Nice pop for that name, up almost 12% right now. Abby, thank you. Jeffrey's weighing in on this, on this story and writing the following. We view these results and the company's reiterated guidance as encouraging. However, we're exercising some level of caution given the uncertain macro environment and ongoing business restructuring. They reiterate their hold rating. That name, though, still up by more than 10% in the first two minutes of trading. Sticking with retail earnings, Costco delivering mixed results, topping earnings estimates, but reporting weaker than estimated revenue and comparable sales. Simone Foxman has more. Hey, Simone. Yeah, John, it took markets a little bit in terms of digesting this. There was a sell-off initially, but then once traders realized there was a pretty large one-time 50 cent per share charge, uh, shares recovered for the most part and now are a little bit higher on the day. But there were signs of weakness in this business, especially in the United States, where Costco gets 74% of its revenue, U.S. comparable sales, excluding fuel and currencies, up 1.8%. The estimate had been for 3.5%. Really, Costco, though, echoing the message we've heard from a lot of big box retailers, smaller ticket size, stronger buying on discretionary stuff, but not so much buying on the bigger margin sorts of things like electronics, uh, home furnishings. A deceleration in sales growth, though, may have been priced in. It had, the company had its weakest sales growth in March in three years, and it didn't accelerate that much in April. Maybe that's why we're seeing some positive numbers today. Still, analysts, though, very positive on the stock. There were 27 buy ratings, 14 hold ratings, but zero sell ratings going into this earnings. Amazing. In line with the broader market, just about positive, up by 0.3%. Simone, thank you. The broader market up by 0.3%. The Nasdaq up by 0.4%. let us sit on the Nasdaq and turn to tech. Workday, lifting its subscription revenue forecast for the rest of the year, easing anxiety over the appetite for corporate software spending. Katie has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Yeah, Workday off to the races this morning. Just some context. This is a company that makes software for HR management, among other things. And like you said, it lifted its guidance for that annual subscription revenue. That is a key metric for this company. Those new numbers are $6.55 billion to $6.58 billion. So bumping up the previous lower end of that range. And like you said, going a long way towards reassuring investors that there's still appetite out there among corporations. Remember, we got some results from Snowflake earlier this week that had fanned concerns, but these workday numbers went a long way towards, again, reassuring investors, not just in the guidance, but also in the previous quarter's results. Fiscal first quarter sales rose 17 percent, topping estimates. Subscription revenue jumped 20 percent, and to boot, the company named a new CFO as well. You've seen sell-side analysts just clamoring to raise their price targets. I've seen three of them already, and you can see that workday shares of about 9% at the moment. The third best performing name on the Nasdaq 100 currently. Katie, thanks for that. Let's get to the number one. It's this one. Marvell recording its biggest intraday jump since 2001, saying it expects revenue from, guess what, AI technology to soar throughout the year. Alex Webb has more. Morning, Alex. Good morning, John. It's really the tale of what we've been seeing with NVIDIA yesterday, the stellar numbers coming out of there. Marvell is in a slightly different space from NVIDIA, but it does make some chips that have AI applications, and that really seems to be what investors are picking up on. The key thing they're saying is that AI revenue will double in fiscal 2024. When you look at the numbers a little bit more closely, it was 200 million in the previous year. So maybe looking at a doubling to 400 million, that's clearly not nothing. But in the scope of more than 5 billion in annual revenue, it is by no means the lion's share. Nonetheless, we've been seeing growth across some of the other areas. Consumer revenue up, carrier infrastructure revenue up. 
enterprise networking revenue up, automotive also up. All those things clearly underlying businesses that continue to do pretty well. The, we do not expect this to be the last time we hear a company bigging up their AI prospects, <laughs> even if some might say they're not as big as you would think. I wonder how much, Alex, that is part of the move today, just talking about it. Alex, the move yesterday in NVIDIA, can we finish on that? Alex, what did you make of that move? Just historic. It's huge numbers. You know, the amount they gained yesterday was more than the entirety of Intel, which was for the longest time the world's biggest chip maker. We're seeing a huge sea change. Talking to analysts today, NVIDIA has placed itself so incredibly cannily, for, you know, encouraging people to use their entire chipsets if they want to get a piece of the AI business, if they want to get a piece of their AI technology as well. It's I think the key thing we take away here is what we've learned about what AI is going to be as a business. It is a cloud business right now. It is a way for Google, Microsoft to get people using their clouds. That's why they're investing so heavily in NVIDIA. And that dictates the way that AI is being distributed to the world. Interesting. Alex, just wonderful coverage, mate, as always. Out of London, Alex Webb there on NVIDIA and other names as well. That helped drive the NASDAQ 100 to its biggest one-day gain for the month of May just yesterday. Some positive follow-through. The NASDAQ up by 0.5%, the S&P up by 0.3%. As tech stocks melt up, our bearish views beginning to melt down. Morgan Stanley's Andrew Sliman now saying stocks could hit 4,600 by year end as FOMO starts kicking in. Quote, if it gets to October and I haven't made money for my clients, then I would start to get nervous. My conjecture is cash starts to get back into the market later into the year. Bank of America's Savita Subramanian boosting her year end target to 4,300, saying the skeptics are making something out of nothing. Narrow breath is not a precursor for doom and gloom. I think it's it's kind of a false negative. And then when you look at valuations right now, they look high, which is another reason nobody wants to buy stocks. But valuations generally look high when you're in an earnings recession, which we are. If we are in this sticky inflationary environment, do you really want to be in cash or bonds? Don't you want to be in stocks that participate in inflation? Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson pushing back. The bear market is continuing, okay? This is what bear markets do. They, they're designed to fool you, confuse you, make you do things you don't want to do, chase things at the wrong time, probably sell them at the wrong time. We think that the fundamental case does not support, you know, where stocks are trading today, whether it's at the index level or at the single stock level. And the second half is going to be a bit choppier and probably downward in the index. Back with us on this story, Chris Mamani, Seema Shah. Seema, I wanted to come to you on this and ask you specifically, does narrow breadth matter to you? Oh, my goodness. Yes, it really matters. Um, look, we have, as I said before, we have a view for a recession, and that implicitly should mean that the S&P 500 will go down. Uh, and yet, then you have the narrow breadth. So at this point in time, it is so important for investors to not just be looking at the index level, but looking deep under. Um, for us, large cap, mega cap um, tech stocks, or specifically mega cap growth, I should say, we're always going to do well in this cyclical environment, right? You have a, a slowdown approaching, you have uh, the Fed at least approaching the end of the cycle. And then, of course, you have the rest of the global economy looking better. So that implicitly should do well for mega cap tech. And then you add in the AI story, and that's a secular driver. So there's a number of reasons why AI, uh, why, what, sorry, mega cap tech should be doing well. But it doesn't mean that the rest of the, the, the market is going to do well. And certainly, if you look under the cover, then actually the other sectors are really struggling. So actually, the recession call... The, uh, the broader market story of weakness does continue to drive through. But that narrow breadth is a number that you're going to see if you look at the screen. You just look at the S&P 500 and you're going to think, wow, things are fantastic. Well, you can look at the S&P 500, or as some people have joked, many people have joked over the last week, you can look at the S&P 495. Now, Krishna, when you look at those two things right now, I think you could have said the same thing for much of the last 10 years at times. Five big names drive the stock market higher. What's different this time? Well, so I, I think Savita is right. Uh, that is... Uh, you know, it always seems like breath is narrow when you are at this point of transition. I think what the, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is tech going to go down or the uh, rest of the market is going to catch up to tech? At least some parts of the rest of the market kept catching up to tech. And I think that really ends up being a call on whether we are going to have a recession or not. And I think on that front, it's quite clear, at least for the, uh, you know, uh, Mike Wilson was talking about the second half. I think second half from a growth perspective there's really no challenge whatsoever if there is any challenge it'll be that the rate cuts would be priced out i don't think that is so bad for the 495. krishna your time horizon is different and time horizon matters you've got a tactical call 
upside risk. And I've been asking this week, is the bigger risk a mount up or a mount down? Do you still think it's that upside risk that's still underappreciated? Yes, I think the upside risk uh, to the market is much larger than the downside risk. The downside risk was contingent on some signs of a recession, and we don't really see that. The, you know, stocks are nominal instruments. When you have this level of nominal growth, the expecting that things are going to just crater, I don't think is a realistic, uh, a realistic uh, thought. The rally in these names has been so polarizing. As you both know, Meta up more than 100%, NVIDIA's more than doubled so far year to date, and it is May 26th. We've got some runway here to get to the end of the year. Seema, I just wonder, do these AI members, these AI winners, speak to another era of U.S. exceptionalism in the equity market? That was where the outperformance was for the last decade. And those names did not exist in Europe. And I feel like this is the early innings of having this conversation again. Is that what this is? I think you're absolutely right. You know, I think for a little bit of time at the beginning of the year when Europe was doing well, um, there were maybe some th considerations that actually this could be shifting into a, a more European decade. Um, and we've just seen from technology that, look, Europe just doesn't have the same kind of names. It doesn't have the same kind of strength. So from that perspective, is, you know, AI, as long as it's not going to go away, as long as regulation doesn't come in and completely clamp, on, clamp it down, then this is suggesting that the U.S. market is a place to be if you're looking out over a 10-year horizon, absolutely. And Krishna, what do you think the message that is being sent right now from the likes of NVIDIA, Meta, Microsoft, to people who are long the Euro stocks 50? Well, uh, the, the message is pretty simple. I think uh, the European economy is slowing down for sure, and uh, Germany is probably the best example of that. And if things uh, bad things happen in China, it gets impacted a lot more. I think the the developed market away from the U.S. at the end of the day still very much remains a trade, and it comes and goes. I think from a longer term perspective, the likelihood that uh, other markets away from uh, away from U.S. are going to do materially better, simply driven by valuation, I don't think is a, a is a is a really good thesis. We've heard that argument a few times, haven't we, Krishna? Over the years. Yes, we have. Krishna Mahi, Seema Shah, to the two of you, wonderful as always. What an interesting moment for this market. It's such a polarizing story right now. If you're in it, you've been loving it. If you're out of it, you're wondering if you should get in or carry on throwing mud at it. Your equity market right now, 13 minutes into the session, positive by 0.6% on both the S&P and on the Nasdaq too. Coming up, more resilient data ahead of the Fed's June meeting. I think this Fed will hike because it is overly data dependent and the data clearly, short term data clearly says hike. That conversation coming up. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Madison Mills, live in the principal room. Coming up, Mizuho Securities Chief Strategist Shoki Omori. That conversation at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, 3.30 in London. This is Bloomberg. I think this Fed will hike because it is overly data dependent and the data clearly Short-term data clearly says hike, even though your measures, your policy measures have a lag in, the, in terms of effects. And this is also a Fed that's so worried about its credibility that it's not going to be wanting to fall behind even more in the perception of people. And it doesn't have the confidence to stand up and say, look, we operate with a lag and we don't want another policy mistake. Mohammed Al Arian on the program in the last hour saying they will hike in June. That's his expectation as things stand. As things stand, there's some runway before we get to June 14th. We have payrolls on June 2nd, CPI on June 13th, and you hope that we get a debt ceiling X date somewhere in between and a deal before we hit it. That's going to be the story over the next couple of weeks. Mike McKee back with us for more. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, the numbers that came in to quote the late great uh, Alec Guinness, uh, are not the droids the Fed is looking for. We saw personal income and personal spending both rise in April over March and inflation rose on a headline and core basis. This is not what the Fed had anticipated, even though they thought we might have some volatility. And here's a really interesting number for you. Uh, we saw goods spending rise more than 
uh, services spending, and we had thought there had been a rotation out of goods. It looks like that is turning around. So that could be a problem down the road if we still start to see goods inflation rise some more. By the way, that PCE core services X housing number uh, that uh, is sort of Jay Powell's talisman, th that rose on a month over month and headline basis during the month of April. So what we're looking for now is the next in the series of numbers you mentioned, John, jobs next week. 188,000. Now that is up from earlier this week. Uh, they do see the Economist Suite survey a slight rise in unemployment, but not a big change in average hourly earnings. So it looks like status quo. And if Mohammed says that means the data are saying raise rates, the Fed's probably going to want to raise rates. Mike amazing, isn't it? That unemployment rate, even with that tick high, is still a full point where the Fed expects it will be by year end. Yeah, and uh, there's no way we're going to get the kind of jobs numbers they're looking at by year end now. So this June meeting is uh, one in which they give us new economic forecasts. It will be interesting to see what they come up with. Hyper-focused on those projections, the summary of economic projections, the SCP in that release. Mike, thank you, sir. Just wonderful work. Tremendous, as always, from Mike McKee on the Federal Reserve and on the economy. Here are the job cuts. JP Morgan notifying 1,000 First Republic employees they aren't being given jobs. Bloomberg breaking the news and reporting that 85% of the failed bank's employees were offered full-time or transitional roles. JP Morgan said this, since our acquisition of First Republic on May 1st, we've been transparent with their employees and kept our promise to update them on their employment status within 30 days. We recognize that they have been under stress and uncertainty since March and hope that today will bring clarity and closure. Shanali, the White Knight, sharpens that sword. The sword is certainly sharpened over there at J.P. Morgan. Remember, J.P. Morgan, John, has expanded its headcount over the last couple of years. They've really bucked the trend already when you've seen about uh, the job cuts that have reduced headcount in certain places on Wall Street. J.P. Morgan just got bigger. Now, with First Republic, remember, there will be roles that are duplicated as they bring in First Republic. And even among the jobs that are offered to First Republic employees here, this is about 85% of the 7,000 employees at First Republic, there are many that are offered as as transitional roles as well. That is transitional roles between the space of uh, three months to a full year. So even in the next year or so, there are going to be questions about how many of these First Republic employees really stay on. This chart is pretty extraordinary and a really fun fact here. This is the compensation per headcount. And at First Republic, you see that it is much more than over at J.P. Morgan. Remember, J.P. Morgan is a very large bank with a lot of consumer businesses here as well. So that pay is very dispersed among a wide array of bankers. First Republic was known to bank wealthy individuals and therefore have a lot of kind of private wealth type bankers, but the pay is large relative to the pay per headcount you see at JP Morgan. Uh, that is what you would expect at a firm like that. JP Morgan is already a story about keeping expenses under control. More on this story ahead, John. Well, speaking of another story, let's squeeze this in. Some reading for the beach this weekend. Fantastic story written by Shanali and the team. Shanali, the headline Infamous hedge fund trade draws fresh screen to me during the debt saga. Just give us a tease of what people can expect in that piece. Yeah, you have to keep an eye on it, John, because if you're J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, or any prime broker on Wall Street, you're probably getting questions here from regulators because they're worried the Fed has had to step in before on highly levered trades that hedge funds have made in the Treasury market. The Treasury market has been very volatile. People are worried about overnight financing. People will continue to be worried about overnight financing. Ripple effects are really still unknown, but hedge funds are certainly levered to this market. Crowded trades in there, John. Very cool. You can find that story on the Bloomberg Terminal and on Bloomberg.com. Shanali, thank you, as always. Let's get you some sector price action. The equity market in this session highs. The Nasdaq up by another 0.8%. Here's Abby. So not surprisingly, John, today with today's gain, a two-day gain for the S&P 500, most sectors are higher, led by tech up more than 1%. We also have discretionary materials, industrials higher. The only sector lower, utilities. This as yields continue to surge higher, those dividends look less attractive. Very interesting, though, on the week, the S&P 500 is down about 7 tenths of 1%, and almost all sectors are lower except for technology. That's true, too, on the year. I was shocked by this. It would actually support the idea that we're going sideways or even down. Internal breadth that you were talking about, uh, not great here. Tech up 32%. Take a look at these other sectors. They are lower, John. That's some real divergence. Abby, thank you for that. Coming up, your trading diary.
Once again, same old story. The Nasdaq leads. Nasdaq 100 up by 1%. About 26 minutes into the session, the S&P doing OK as well, up by 0 0.6. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary coming up. Umich sentiment survey, top of the hour to next week. Markets closed, of course, for Memorial Day on Monday. U.S. consumer confidence numbers out on Tuesday, Thursday. Secretary Yellen's X date plus ISM's manufacturing. And Friday is the U.S. payrolls report. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. And please Please do enjoy the long weekend. I'll catch up with you on Tuesday. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.